final program in the 2021 series and virtual panels. Bevel Conway was part of a robust program in 2019, The Eyes Mind, with Olivia Parker, Sean O'Neill, and Rosamond Purcell, and he is with us this evening. Among some of the questions we posed then were, how do scientific ideas evolve? How do we represent ideas and the impact of science? And how do we make sense of the world around us and in us? And perhaps we will um, address some of those things again. We are asking our participants what they're up to and how their respective catalyst conversations have stayed with them. This evening, I'm having that conversation with neuroscientist Bevel Conway. In contrast to what we normally do at Catalyst, the conversation is between the two of us. Bevel Conway is a senior investigator at the National Eye Institute in the Laboratory of Sensory Motor Research. His lab aims to understand the brain processes by which sense data are transformed into perceptions, thoughts, and actions. Work in the lab has been especially invested in developing color as a model system. The lab uses a combination of techniques, including psychophysics and non-invasive brain imaging in humans, along with experimental fMRI-guided microelectrode recording, fMRI-guided pharmacological blockade, microstimulation, track tracing, and computational modeling to test hypotheses about causal mechanisms. Conway is also a wonderful visual artist and has written on the intersection between art, art practice, and neuroscience. So with that, Bevel is going to share some of his recent work with us, uh, or maybe previous and recent, and we'll have a conversation together um, following that, and you can join in, as Eduardo said, through the chat or by raising your hand, and Eduardo will be on hand to help us with that. So, Bevel, it's yours. Great, thanks. Okay, so here we are. I'm going to share my screen, do that, share, and then do that, and... Um, great, it's super wonderful to be here. Uh, I was just watching people come in. I, I have a few, I just saw Nona Hershey. I wanna give a little shout out. Hi, Nona. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, one of my, she's, Hi, one of, she's my, one of my mentors and teachers taught me how to make prints. So it's, it's sort of delightful to- And collector. And, coll and collector, yes. <laughs> so um, I am going to, um, we're gonna take a step back and we're gonna think about um, the brain and the eye as this interface between the outside stuff out there, the world, and, um, and what, we what we make of it. So uh, a lot of people think of the brain as, I mean, I have to say for me, when I first was in, as an undergraduate, I didn't, didn't think about the brain at all. If I wanted to, Think about how we saw it was like well you open your eyes it just sort of seemed obvious um, but over the last 20 or 30 years it's become clear to me that the brain is doing a lot of stuff on sense data in order to make the world out there visible and um, it's not simply a translation like a kind of um, photographic film that maybe you know, developed, but that's not sort of what the brain is doing. It's actually actively interpreting what's happening out there in the world, at least the image cast on the retina. And, um, and that process of interpretation, I think is evident in how artists work and in, in what they do. So, so we, we can think of art as a data about how the brain works. <clears throat> so to put this in context for the artists, what I like, what I'm working on right now is this sort of framework of thinking about the brain as an artist's medium. And um, I'll, hopefully I'll be able to persuade you of this. So um, what's a medium? A medium is the, the way in which we store, encode, and transmit information. Um, and that medium, the medium we use in this case, this is Matisse's oil on canvas, that medium influences the way in which the artist, it influences the message. It influences what kinds of messages can be encoded and how they're encoded. So in this case, you know, the oil paint is thick and gooey and stiff and you can see the brush marks. Uh, this is an etching by David Hockney. Um, again, it's a different medium and it allows a different kind of message to be represented. This is a, a beautiful drawing by Egon Schiele. Um, again, it's a different medium, and you can see 
the medium is influencing what kind of a message can be transmitted. And of course, we can push to any direction of media. This is a watercolor, a little detail of a watercolor of mine. You can see the paint sits in a different plane above the, the paper um, so that the paper, the texture of the, the, the paper and the paint are kind of occupying different domains. Um, this is a glass and silk sculpture I made. Again, the medium is very much influencing the kind of message that, um, that you can communicate. And here's a, 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 a fantastic mural just outside of Columbus, Ohio, uh, um, using spray paint. And you can see, again, the medium is the sort of loud gesture. You can see the evidence of the arm, the arc of the arm. That medium is reflecting the kind of message that can be communicated. So for each of these different examples, you can see the impact of the choice of materials on what the artist can say and how they say it and sort of what that message is. And the argument I'm going to try and make is that common to all of these uh, artists is the brain and the brain in the way in which it encodes, stores and transmits information is a medium. And by understanding how that medium works, how the brain works, we can understand what kinds of messages we transmit. So I'm going to blow through a whole bunch of slides today. And if you only sort of take in one thing, it's just this idea that the brain is actively working to process information and the way in which it processes information influences what kinds of messages, what kinds of uh, images, how we represent those images. So this is a fundoscopic image of the, of the retina. So when you go to the doctor, uh, the ophthalmologist, and they put in those eye drops inside your eye. Uh, this is the picture that she's looking at as she looks down at, at your uh, at your retina. Um, <clears throat> and you can see right away there's some structure there. So that little bit identified as the fovea, that's the part of your retina that lines up with the center of gaze. And at that location, there's a very high density of photoreceptors. So you can see with very high acuity um, what, what the light information that hits your fovea. Meanwhile, to the right, you can see the optic nerve head there. That's where all the blood vessels enter into the eyeball to nourish it. And there you actually have no, uh, no photoreceptors at all. You're actually blind. So that's the blind spot. And we all have a blind spot in both eyes. We carry them around with us wherever we go. And yet most of the time we never even notice them. Um, uh, which is kind of remarkable because the blind spot is sort of about the size of a quarter held at arm's length, not that far away from the fovea. Uh, your brain knows it's there and kind of just fills in. It says, you know what? We know that there's nothing there, but we're going to make our best guess. Um, so because of this uh, lack of uh, homogeneity across the retina, because it's there's different acuity at different parts in the retina, we have to move our eyes in order to actually encode information. And this is a famous picture of Yarba showing this pattern of eye movements. And I think that the pattern of eye movements, which is, again, this is part of the medium of the eye and the brain, that that is the way in which we encode that information, I think eye movements are reflected in the process of making a drawing. Um, in this ink drawing, you can see Matisse's uh, kind of overworking or emphasizing that line down the side, which is where the lightest light and the darkest dark would have met. And it's that same line that's tracing out where we would expect his eyes to be moving. So his hand is actually tracking his eyes uh, up and up and down along the edge of that of that figure. These letters are scaled for visual acuity. So if you look right at the very center, each of the letters is made big enough so that they're all equally visible. And now when you scan the image, you can see that the acuity, your ability to resolve those letters, falls off dramatically as you move not very far away from the center of gaze. So that means that actually to read any word at a decent scale of text, uh, that's longer than maybe three or four letters long, you actually have to move your eyes, which is remarkable because our experience of vision is one of an instantaneous everything in focus at once. And yet actually it's this magic that the brain is doing to stitch together in time, almost like a kind of piece of music bound in time, one eye movement to the next to give you the illusion that, that everything is in focus at, at one instant. 
And I think artists like Matisse, I mean, this is true of, I think, almost every visual artist, they actively manipulate the spatial scale of the marks in order to direct the viewer's eyes so that the painting becomes a kind of movie, a set of instructions to guide the eyes of the viewer through the canvas. Uh, so you can see this scale of marks at the, at the very center, at those, those flowers where they're tighter and then moving more peripheral to the big swastas of color out in the periphery. Matisse is actually instructing you how to move your eyes through the canvas. Uh, and in works like this, where he's got these two kind of foci of attention, the flowers and the woman's face, you can feel this kind of instability as you don't really know where you're supposed to settle. Uh, and I think it's in that way that he's actually encoding something about the unsettled time in which he was making this picture, which was, you know, during the Second World War. Um, the contemporary artists like David Hockney work with these same tools because these are hardwired tools that, that are that characterize the kind of medium we have, the brain we have. So in this case, Hockney's putting his fine little details that attract your eye right down at the bottom. And almost everybody, when they look at this picture, will start somewhere in the center. And then all of those marks cascade down in a way that captures your eye and brings you down to settle down at the bottom in a kind of restful place. Hockney inverts this sometimes to make the background higher textured. So your eyes sort of is, is uh, in some ways, treating the background now as a texture, but it's still got all of that granularity to it. Um, and, and this introduces a new kind of instruction to the viewer's gaze. So it's a set of tools that the, um, the artist can work with. Or this is a, the brain is providing a set of tools that you can then reconfigure in different kinds of ways. Um, this is a, a picture to illustrate the difference between foveal vision and peripheral vision. So most people, when they look at this, they see a picture of um, Einstein. But if you shrink it down, you can see that the blurry components that are only visible to your peripheral vision uh, now captures Marilyn Monroe. Um, so I'll do that again. Um, and this just tells us that that peripheral, that peripheral vision isn't just uh, sort of crappy vision, it's actually encoding different kinds of information. And we think that that peripheral vision is encoding, we call it low spatial frequencies or the kind of blurry components that might be associated with smiling, where the deep musculature that generates the expressions in the face cause this very subtle uh, shading uh, that's actually what uh, the makeup industry is trying to reconstitute um, through you know, rouge and so on. Um, you get wonderful examples like Chuck Close, who's inverting this, uh, this, this problem, making the high spatial frequency components, the local elements, divorced in content from the global low spatial frequency, the broader picture. So that now these two um, systems, the, the where you're looking and, and the peripheral vision, are actually telling you two very different pieces of information, which generate a whole new kind of uh, visual puzzle visual interest. And I think John Baldessari really understood a lot of these issues. Uh, and in his commission paintings, he kind of playfully um, takes up this question of where you look. Um, he commissioned some artists, he called them Sunday painters, uh, to basically paint copies of Polaroid photographs of his friend pointing at random things in the environment. And Baldessari is asking this question, where are you looking? Where do you choose to look? And for an artist, a visual artist, that's sort of the big starting question. Where are you looking and where do you, where do you think you should be looking? I'll just try and keep track of time here. So there's another one by um, Waldasari. Now, once the signals make their way into the brain, the first stage inside the retina, uh, just behind the photoreceptors, is not encoding absolute light levels, it's actually encoding relative light levels. And uh, demonstrations like this actually uncover the nature of that contrast calculation. So you can see as you move your eyes, there are all these scintillating dots, they're all illusory dots that your brain is filling in much the way it fills in what happens in your blind spot because it's thinking that there should be some local contrast there given the local elements all around it. 
Uh, and that local contrast is the currency that a visual artist who's making a, a representation on a, on a two-dimensional surface is working with. Um, and there are all sorts of uh, assumptions that the brain as medium is bringing to the interpretation of that image. So in this case, the background consists of a gradual shading that goes from dark to light at the, from top to bottom. That disc, however, is perfectly uniform in gray from top to bottom. And yet we perceive it as being a kind of bump, having some three-dimensional structure because the brain takes in all of this light information and, and says, well, the most likely interpretation of this configuration is not as a gradual change in illumination that's barely, barely perceptible, but as a three-dimensional object. Because for most of the things we see in the world, they, they comprise these three-dimensional objects. Um, and this really underscores this main puzzle that the brain is trying to solve, which is that the retinal information, the light cast on your eye, on the back of your eye is underdetermined. It can mean lots of different things. So for example, if you're walking around in the rainforest and you see a little squiggle in your peripheral vision, you know that light information is su isn't sufficient for you to know what it is. But if you're in the jungle, you might be like, oh, that's a snake. Whereas you know, sitting in my office, I see a little squiggle. I'll be like, oh, that's an extension cord or something. Um, and that kind of a puzzle that is the brain trying to fill in all the missing pieces uh, tells us that there's a lot of active um, kind of information or interpretation that's taking place uh, in the brain, even looking at very distilled or limited uh, uh, demonstrations or images like this. Um, and this idea of how the brain manages to reconstruct an image from the light cast on the retina uh, provides an opportunity for artists like Seurat to expand the potential gamut of lightness uh, levels available um, or ap appearing in a, in a two-dimensional picture. So the light that hits a two-dimensional surface is always going to be reduced compared to the light levels you might see out in the world. So as you're looking around in the world, uh, you will see, you know, variations in light level that far exceed what you can capture on a two-dimensional surface. Mm -hmm. So the idea that, you know, I was taught in art school that we should just paint what we see. That's just physically impossible. You can't do that because the light out there is way greater than the light you than, than the light levels you can capture on a two-dimensional sheet of paper. So how do artists do this? They leverage the medium of the brain, the way in which the brain encodes that information in order to give the illusion of something of greater lightness that then carries with it a kind of significance that, that captures in greater reality your experience of the world that would be captured by you know, a, a, a photographic representation you might take just with a camera. So the next stage of processing is you sort of head up. This is a ventral view of the brain showing the, the optic radiation of, the, of the, you know, the optic nerves coming out of the back of the eye and then crossing at the optic chiasm and then radiating up into primary visual cortex, which ironically sits as far away from the eyes as you can get in the cerebral cortex. At that stage, there's a whole other layer of information processing. And that, uh, that layer of, of, of the system is encoding edges predominantly. And you can see this reflected in the tendency we have as artists to, to capture objects with edges, with lines, which is paradoxical because there are very few lines in the world. Um, so that these, are, these kinds of representations are effective because they're leveraging the medium of the brain, the way in which the brain is encoding that information, and they're providing a stimulus that is similar enough to the real world, um, and yet uh, uh, allows the artist to do that encoding in an economical way with just a few lines, a few marks. And you can see in um, the drawing I showed earlier, if this is a more mature drawing by Egon Schiele, this great restraint where instead of overemphasizing, doing the kind of default thing of the emphasis, overemphasis of the lines, you have Schiele actually leaving a gap right where you would expect to have a line. Uh, and so in this way, what he's doing is serving up a puzzle that requires the visual system of a viewer to then complete. So instead of giving you the full information to know that it's a face, he sort of 
giving you elements of it, which, which make it in some sense more visually engaging. And he did this again and again. It's um, almost a kind of little trick, this little gap he puts right around the chin. There it is again. This is my favorite one because he does it on both sides of the face. So in fact, the top half of the head is entirely detached from the bottom and it's almost bistable. So I can almost see this as a little piece of, you know, a woman's head chopped in half floating off into the horizon. But the, my visual system wants to stitch it back together because that, that would be, um, you know, improbable to see the top half of someone's head floating off. Um, okay, so, um, out of primary visual cortex, we make our way through to a large number of parts of the cerebral cortex, somewhere upwards of 30% of the cerebral cortex is now involved in processing what's happening from primary visual cortex. And uh, a lot of the bits of brain I'm interested in are involved in processing color. So these are color can be distinguished from kind of the luminance component, but the relationship between color and luminance gray value is not trivial. And we can spend a lot of time talking about the, the, that. Um, for example, yellow and white are equiluminant. They could, in fact, yellow under many circumstances is even brighter than a white. And that's a paradox because uh, if you're a painter and you use yellow paint, that pigment is actually absorbing some of the incident light. And so the light reflected into your eye is actually lower. There are fewer photons coming off of the yellow surface than the, than the white surface. So again, this is another example uh, of the way in which the brain is interpreting what it's seeing, not, uh, not encoding in some veridical sense what the physics of, of light is that's hitting the retina. Um, this is a great uh, quote. I, I love this quote from Michael Fried describing this painting by Larry Coons, where he says, under the gallery's bright lights, the dots tend to flicker and jump and blink and flare until we begin to fear for our retinas, if not our minds. Um, so what, um, Poons has done in this image is he's created these dots where they have the same gray value. They have the same brightness value as the background and the parts of your brain that require luminance contrast in order to function. Those bits of brain are the ones that tell you about where stuff is in the environment and, and they tell you about motion. So by doing this, what Poons has done is essentially disabled that bit of brain and it's sending out these big error signals saying, what's out there? I don't get it. I don't know what, what, what I, 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 and that error signal is this, uh, you know, more poetically captured by the, by the Freed quote. Um, and if you render images, this is from my PhD advisor, Margaret Livingstone. If you render images with, um, with, equiluminant colors, that is colors that have the same brightness value, you essentially get rid of a lot of information about a, the spatial structure of a scene. Um, if you take this image and you look at it through a color filter, uh, that will introduce a luminance contrast, and then you'll be able to see the depth in these images. So there's a few there. Um, this is a painting by Monet, that is the kind of uh, moniker that became Impressionism, um, where Monet has painted the sun in a color that's equiluminate with the gray background. So it's almost identically uh, the same gray value. And that's completely impossible. The sun is always brighter than the surround. So why did Monet do this? He did this, we've argued, and um, Marge Livingstone argues this in her book, uh, that he, he did this in order to create this illusion of a shimmery quality. That is to give you the feeling of a sun that's bright and shimmery, that same feeling you would have looking at, uh, at a sunset or a sunrise that you can't actually capture given the limitations of pigments, but he can capture it by leveraging the medium of the visual system and the visual brain. So, um, my lab has discovered that down the temporal lobe, this is now the ventral belly of the brain, there are actually these parallel channels where you have a large amount of tissue that's implicated in processing color. Staggeringly, one of our discoveries was that there is about as much brain power allocated to 
using, encoding, processing, handling color as there is involved in face perception, face recognition. And that was surprising to us and to a lot of people because we think of color as just this low level stimulus feature. It's just like a bit of fluff. I mean, you can see black and white movies just fine, the people in them, the narrative and so on. Why do we have all of this tissue involved in color? And it's forced us to go back and reevaluate some assumptions we have about what color does for us in behavior. Um, so uh, well, one idea that we, that we sort of uh, have advanced is this idea that that color information is not being used so much to tell you about the structure in the world in, this, in the way in which, for example, da Vinci may be using luminance and color and Sufumato and all his tricks to tell you about the structure of faces but instead much more in a kind of Matisse way, color is serving this other purpose, this kind of symbolic or, or you know, almost much more related to emotions or, or valence, behavior, the sort of behavioral state of the thing. Um, and you, he can do this, Matisse can do this by capturing in color the appropriate value relationship so that you still read it as a face, but the colors then can be divorced from the natural colors of a face in order to tell a different story. Um, so we've spent a lot of time thinking about color and how color is encoded. And one of the key things that we know in the beginning stage is that uh, color depends a lot on spatial contrast. So you can turn a gray patch into a blue patch or a yellow patch just by varying the spatial structure so that the two circles on each side are physically identical uh, but one looks blue and the other looks yellow because of the local context and what the kind of interpretation your brain brings to what the lighting conditions are. And we've spent quite a bit of time worrying about this particular puzzle, which is related to color constancy, because this is a, a kind of an unresolved problem. The brain has very limited information about, uh, about the colors in the world and has to end the lighting conditions. And so it only gets one piece of information, the light coming to your eye from a surface. And that one piece of information is the product of two variables. It's the lighting conditions, which can change, and the surfaces in the environment can change. So how does your brain disentangle or untangle these two pieces of information so that colors remain stuck to objects and consistently stuck to objects? Uh, and this is just a painting of Monet's haystacks to illustrate this point where he's painted the shadow with a blue paint to reflect the fact that the sky, the illuminant in the shadow has a blue bias. And most people don't see that blue. Uh, and, and this was the genius of Monet through his practice. He was able to actually make visible to himself the colors of the illuminant. And these, uh, the, the impact of the illuminants have a dramatic effect on how we render colors. Um, this is, uh, you know, in movie posters, for example, there, there's a very strong tendency to be biased towards the colors of we call it the daylight axis, bright orange sun and the blue sky. And you will never see another movie poster again the same way because you see it over and over and over again. Um, and it was the explanation that I provided for this uh, infamous image um, where some people saw it as white and gold and other people saw it as blue and black. And my argument uh, was that it's because some people are assuming that the illuminant is blue. And so they subtract from the image, their brains unconsciously subtract from the image, a little bit of the blue component, which renders it uh, essentially white and gold. Other people assume it's in direct sunlight and they, they, they remove a little bit of the orange component because of the orange sunlight that they think is illuminating the dress and they then see it as blue and black. And that, Hypothesis has now been supported by a, a number of empirical studies. Um, and it was my little moment of fame. Uh, back in 2015, they made a little Lego icon on the short news. And I, and my students found this for me. And of course, I'm, <laughs> I think it's fun. <laughs> anyway, um, so local color contrast is not news. Uh, John, Joseph Albers illustrated this beautifully with his, uh, his two X's that are physically the same color. You trace them up. Uh, and that the, um, the data we have in the brain is that this calculation that makes that gray look yellow on one side and gray on the other side is because of the very local interactions in the painting. Uh, 
Um, and it, we can recover a stable perception by just obliterating that very local interaction. Um, and I think this is in part what Matisse is doing in his paintings where he leaves little white gaps around some of his colored marks in order to insulate them against color induction. Uh, you know, he certainly had enough paint. He was a wealthy man by this stage. He didn't just run out of paint. Um, and I think he's doing this intentionally so as to retain the stability of the colors uh, in the finished painting. Uh, and he did this again and again and again. Um, and it's not, you, you can do it also with black as Max Beckman showed. And I think what ends up happening when you do this is you, you end up redirecting the image to emphasize color and color is now serving this role that is no longer about uh, spatial structure, three-dimensional structure. And as a result, these paintings by Matisse and Beckman start to take on a very kind of flat, almost carpet-like quality uh, because color isn't providing that service to you as, a, as an organism. It isn't telling you about the three-dimensional structure of stuff. It's telling you some other piece of information. And we actually, as scientists, have very little about what that piece of information is. We have lots of speculation, but not a lot of data. But the, 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 the consequence of this movement um, really uh, spurred by um, the development of new pigments um, redirected artists to care much more about the surface of images. And the argument I've made <clears throat> is that it, the legacy is then work that becomes entirely divorced of uh, any kind of representation. So you have early Rothko's that are breaking down representation to the point where they're just these pure color fields. Um, now, uh, I'm gonna go through all of that and that, and I'm gonna skip now to, um, so there's my, there's the Matisse. You can see this beautiful capturing of the luminous structure in the image um, that he's able to do uh, in the context of these rather, um, extraordinary colors. Okay, so um, I'm gonna skip through that and I'm gonna end. Now, Deborah asked me to say a few things about my own art. So I'm gonna do that very briefly. I've sort of randomly pulled together um, examples of three bodies of work. So these are glass and silk sculptures. Um, so there's an example of one, there's another one, there's another one. And there's another one. And I'm happy to talk about what's going on in these if you're at all interested. Um, and then there I have etchings. So this was Nona taught me how to make etchings. Um, so there's a frontispiece that was used for a book by David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel. And there they are, the pioneers of visual neuroscience, pulling back the curtain on the early stage of the visual system to understand how the structure of the visual system brings about vision. Um, this is uh, another um, etching. Uh, these are, this is a, a white ground etching and um, they're little cards on which is painted images of Mark Morris in one of his early dances um, sitting on a windowsill. Uh, and there's uh, another hard ground etching with an aquatint. Um, there's a sugar lift etching, Tanglewood. It's called a brief, uh, it's called While They Were Having Dinner with Ellsworth Kelly. <laughs> I was visiting my friend Mark at uh, Mark Morris, the choreographer at Tanglewood, and was there painting and drawing and making etchings. I did this on site, drawing the ink while I was, uh, you know, on looking out at this view and, um, and uh, Mark had this other guest, Ellsworth Kelly, show up. So I was ushered out of the living room and into the garden. And I was like, but I want to meet Ellsworth Kelly. <laughs> I didn't get to meet Ellsworth Kelly. Um, this is a watercolor, relatively recent watercolor done in Delaware. There's a, that was done this weekend in Shenandoah. And there's a memory color painting. And that's it. So now I'll stop sharing. Let's see how much time we've got. 
Okay, so that was a little longer than you wanted. Oh, that's perfect. Oh, there's Carrie. Hi, Caroline Jones. Yay, oh, I love seeing people. <laughs> I do too, actually. So I just want to um, formally say thank you, Bevel. That was terrific. And I know you left out things you probably could have spoken for two hours. So um, I have some prepared questions, but I think it would be really fun and interesting for anyone in uh, any attendee who would like to pose a question uh, to Bevel. Um, so you can unmute yourself um, or raise your hand and uh, Eduardo will uh, help us with uh, doing so. <laughs> Everyone at this point should be able to unmute yourself. Let me know if you're not able to. No, no, I see the chat and you say, do you want to show the Lingelbach image? Which one is that one? I don't, I'm confused. That's the one with all the dots. The one with all the dots. Oh, the one oh. With all the dots that we were hallucinating. The Larry Poon's image? No, the Lingelbach was some neuroscientist. Oh, 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 oh the Hermann Grid illusion. Yeah. Yes, sure. I can definitely show that again. Sorry. Okay, let me do that. So are we a small enough group? Yeah, that? there you are. That's owned by Caroline Jones. <laughs> I'm here with my Bevel Conway. <laughs> and I want to ask you to put on your cultural historian hat, which I know mm -hmm. you love playing with. And um, mm -hmm. why is color so moralized? Why are there centuries in which people who love color are, you know, victims of sumptuary laws and, right, they're accused of being indulgent and frivolous and why, why, is, why, why does culture enter into a moralizing relationship to color in art, in clothing, in, like, what's that about? Yeah, I think that is what color is about. So I think, um, you know, we, we've spent so much of the 20th century trying to expunge from vision the, vis the, the frivolous, the fluff, you know, we think of the, the you know, it, at least in visual neuroscience, there is a very strong tradition of only using black and white images because the black and white image has everything you need, you know, for recognition. Um, and um, there is, as a result of that decision, which itself came about in part because reproduction in color was so challenging. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, there's this, there's this strange paradox, which is early visual neuroscientists, I'm going to make a caricature, Early visual neuroscientists said, we want to study vision. How are we going to do that? We need some visual stimuli. So what we're going to do is we're going to use black and white pictures because color reproduction is just crappy. It just doesn't work. People look funny. It's like the colors are all washed out. The technology isn't good enough and it's really expensive. And at the same time, you don't really need it because I can recognize faces beautifully. Okay, so I'm going to redirect. I'm going to redirect because that's okay as a historical theory, but it's not really sufficient. So I want to play to your strength in understanding color through research as an emotional information system. Right. Okay. And I'm going to speculate that the reason why color is historically attacked long before we are worried about using reproductions mm -hmm. in neuroscience experiments, right? Mm -hmm. You know, where, you know, Poussin is like kind of using color but pretending to only be thinking about line. Okay, mm -hmm. um, is because of our relationship to emotion. We are, we want people to control it. We don't want too much of it. Mm -hmm. we, we think people who are too emotional are unstable, right? So mm -hmm. anyway, that's a speculation. I, we don't have to talk about it more, but I think it's an, no, interesting, I think it's exactly I think it's right. an interesting outcome of your own research. Yeah, no, it's exactly I right. I think about. Yeah, so I, the, the bit about the technology was just warming up to say, that there, we lived then through this moment where ironically, we ended up using these images that didn't have color 
and became completely fixated, like a kind of diagnosis momentum, just on this piece of what is vision, blinded with blinders to all of this other stuff that we get from normal visual experience, of which color serves this huge role, and it doesn't have much to do with recognition. So if you ask people, what is vision for? You know, 200 years ago, they would say vision does lots of stuff. I mean, they wouldn't have framed the question that way, but they would have said, yeah, it's about emotional, evaluating the emotional salience of stuff and having identity and um, tagging, you know, each other's social groups and, uh, you know, the use of symbolism in, you know, Mary representations of the Virgin Mary and color served this huge role that had very little to do with recognition. Uh, it's only in this sort of current moment where we're like, hey, hang on a minute. We, we thought we were studying this. Now there's all of this cortex brain tissue that's involved in color. What the hell is that for? Uh, where we're sort of redirecting as a scientific community to go back and ask questions from a kind of cultural historical lens about, uh, about color's role. I think, um, you know, right now, my kind of hunch is that color isn't telling you about identity. It's not telling you about what stuff is. It's telling you about whether or not you should care about it. Mm. And I think the best evidence for that is sort of straightforward. When you look at, you know, bananas, what color is a banana? A lot of people will tell you a banana is yellow. It's a reflexive answer. But it's because they're actually, the, the, the question that's asked isn't, isn't the question we're actually answering. We're answering a different question, which is, what are the colors of bananas you care about? Because most bananas actually right now are not yellow. Most bananas are green or they're about to be black. <laughs> you know, they spend very little of their time being yellow. Um, and because it's so kind of bound up and tied up with what we are using color for, that is color is so fundamentally important to the way in which we relate to the world, we just don't even, it's like, as I said at the beginning, it's like, how does vision work? You open your eyes. It's like the new frontier of that problem. How does color work? Well, it's just obvious or it's irrelevant. Uh, and I think it's, these, it's this double-headed thing. It's both super duper important and what it is important for is this indeterminate thing that is color isn't reflexively tied. Red means love and red means hate. It's it's capable of doing many different things under different kinds of contexts. And because of that, you know, the fact that color isn't, isn't kind of reflexively tied to something and because um, it's so fundamentally important, we're really stuck in this puzzle where culturally throughout history, people have been very like uneasy about it because it's so powerfully important and because it speaks to very much important issues about who we are, our identities. Um, so it becomes a kind of a dangerous thing. Uh, Bevel, I'm going to ask you to um, unshare the screen so we can see everybody. Uh, there's a couple. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, Here we are. A of, uh, questions. Just... We have a question from uh, Robert Goss. Robert, if you would please. Uh, yeah, you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. This. Uh, oh, here, what's that? Here. <laughs> All right. Keep flipping around. Uh, the question is, you were talking about the brain and the vision, uh, but the, my question is whose brain and whose vision, what age, what ability, what disability are we talking, you know, is a 40, 40 year old normally educated person seeing differently than a five year old or a yes. three year old or yes. a 90 year old with yes. uh, Alzheimer or myself a TBI survivor. Right, right. Everyone's right. Seeing, yes. You know, and what you're talking about was the normal, healthy, perfect brain. And yep. how many of us here have that? <laughs> I think that's a really terrific question. I remember I had the same kind of, um, I don't know, the same kind of question when the Human Genome Project announced having sequenced the human genome. And I was like, whose genome? I mean, the human gene? Like we all lift, look different because we have different genes. So whose genome are they sequencing? And I remember being very confused. <laughs> So the answer is the answer is there is some common structure, uh, and we are in our studies, for example, in the brain imaging studies, we're measuring the brain responses averaged across you know eighteen or twenty people who meet sort of normal visual criteria. That is, they pass basic vision tests. Mm -hmm. um, 
we do actually have a number of research programs or projects aimed at looking at brains of people who have various kinds of visual anomalies. So they have different visual genetics, color vision genetics. But I want to bracket all of that and, and um, argue, you know, um, one, of the, one of the kinds of uh, working hypotheses that I have is that, you know, we need to have a reshift in the, a shift in the way we think about how brains work. So instead of thinking about the brain as being filled in with information from the outside world, um, I think a better way to think about it is the brain is sort of sitting there working and it's kind of filling out the world with visual information. Um, and there's some lovely examples, like bits of data that have sort of stuck in the literature that have been very confusing, um, that are consistent with that idea. Namely, it turns out that people who are totally blind from birth have a very rich conceptual color knowledge. They actually relate to colors. They have vivid color sort of pictures they can carry in their mind's eyes. Uh, and they've never seen, no, no color information has ever entered their eyes. So where are they getting that color knowledge from? And the argument that I've made is they're getting that color knowledge because their brains are primed up to extract color information. And when the eyes aren't giving them that color information, they're getting it through communication by listening to other people talk about color and the way in which they relate to colors. Uh, and that social dimension is again, the key thread here. That color is about the way in which we relate to each other and the way we have the world relate to us. Um, so this is all a long-winded way of saying, I think actually brains, even in a quote unquote disease state or in an old state or whatever, they're designed to actually be pretty robust against those kinds of perturbations to, to be able to function in a way that gives you an experience of the world that you can communicate effectively and have sort of in a sense shared with me. Mm. So, um, okay. <laughs> Eduardo, would you like to ask? Um, yes, we have a question from uh, Ilana. And her question is, uh, is there a change in how you remember color? Is there a change in how you remember color? Mm -hmm. I'm hearing these questions come in and all I wanna know is like what, you know, other people think. <laughs> I'm curious what she thinks. Do you, Ilana, do you think there's a change in, you're on mute or I can't hear you. Um, I just unmuted. I don't know if you can hear me now. I can hear you now, yeah? Um, what I'm really curious about is I find that if you, at, if you see something, everybody's seeing somewhat differently. But if you ask somebody to recall and tweet what they remember, mm. it's interesting. There's something that happens and changes in memory. I'm, I haven't identified it. I'm really asking. Yeah. There's a, something, a tie mm -hmm. between color vision mm. and memory. Yeah. So um, it's fascinating because color is actually used in a lot of psychological research on memory, where uh, the sort of title or abstract of a paper never says color, but then you look at how they're measuring it and they're using color as this probe of memory. And that body of literature, Tim Brady is one fellow, if you wanted to look him up, he's been doing some very interesting work. That body of literature has come up with some very surprising findings. One of which is our memories for colors are really crappy. So unless color is actually meaningful and relevant to you, uh, the chance that you're gonna remember it is, almost, is like vanishingly small. It's, it's worse than most other bits of information you're confronted with in the environment which for me was really reassuring because that's the hallmark of, of a system that has prioritized color to do something really important because you don't wanna hang on to this thing unless it's actually relevant and important to you. Um, so, you know, if you ask your friends, you know, go into a room in a party and then leave at the end of the day and say, so what color was their couch or what color was the carpet or what color was this? And if they're not interested in furniture or they weren't interested in, that you'll be like, you spent the whole night sitting on the couch. What, you know, what color was my shirt? It's like, they will be like, my, I don't know, pretty. Um, so there's that, there's that piece. There's another piece, which is 
that the way in which we encode color is uh, appears to be deeply influenced by the labels that we apply to it. So when you are forced to remember a color and it's a completely abstract random thing, what we will do, what people will do is they'll sort of say, oh, well, it's a kind of the orangey one. Uh, and then they'll hang on to that label, which can sit in semantic memory much longer than this perceptual stuff can stay there. Um, so that's another piece. Another way we've probed memory for colors has to do with um, face perception. So we showed that the perception of face color is incredibly fine tuned. So that um, if you look at faces and you all the other information about the face is there, like you can see them moving, you're interacting with them, uh, but the color information is absent because you're looking at them under, for example, low pressure sodium light, those old you know, um, lights you might've seen in, in parking garages. Under that kind of light source, faces and only faces look very weird and they look green, mm -hmm. uh, which is a completely imagined color. There's nothing green in the stimulus, but it's again, it's one of these error signals where your brain is telling you color and faces is super important. You have violated my memory of what that color should be. Something is wrong with this person. I think they look green and sick and you need to sort of pay attention. <laughs> Thank and, you so much. Yeah, I'm no, happy. And uh, so we have a question from So Young. If you could please unmute your mic. Hi. Um, oh, can, hang on. Can I, yes, can we I, can hear you. I, Oh, sorry, my hair looks like that. Um, actually, I'm Lucy, Lucy Kim. It's using my legal name. But um, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, your artwork is beautiful. And um, I have, um, I'm an artist and I'm interested in um, neuroscience. So I've read some stuff, but I've also, uh, you know, listened to a couple of your lectures and I've learned so much from you. I've learned so much from Margaret Livingstone's lectures. Um, and I've read some Eric Kendall and Etc. Mm -hmm. And I, this is more of a question, sort of a concern that's been rising as I've been reading all this really fascinating um, research in, about mm -hmm. the intersection of neuroscience and art. Mm -hmm. But um, so it's a more of a concern, but I'd love to hear what you have to say, which is that this knowledge or empirical data regarding color and um, art and, and, you know, our brain and vision it seems to be merging and like a lot of the examples being used are being pulled from, I would say a pretty convenient, readily available Western canon. Mm -hmm. um, so like the Western masters, which, you know, I also love, and that was my education as well, but, mm -hmm. but I am one, I am sort of concerned about this knowledge being tacked on or retroactively layered onto these, already canonized artists and sort of streamlining with this, I, I think like mildly problematic. Not yeah, mildly, yeah. No, mildly, I think, yeah, so I'm actually, I would love to hear, cause you also as an artist, like I am really yeah. curious what you would have to yes. say. Yes, I share the same anxiety. So I would say, um, it's, and this is like a whole other hour conversation. Um, uh, let's see. Um, First, I would point you to an essay that I wrote with Alexander Redding called Neuroaesthetics and the Trouble with Beauty. And it's open access, you can get it online. And um, if you can't find it, incidentally, I, I'm on, I finally am now on Twitter. So if you have a question after this, you can tweet it at me and I will happily engage for hours because it's a great distraction from other things and talking about these issues is way more fun than any other work. Um, so if you can't find it, let me know. It's just at Bevel Conway, this is my name. But um, so check out this essay because we basically take this issue head on in that essay. And we say, look, it's kind of problematic that in judgments of beauty, scientists are appealing to the traditions that they find they love and have near and dear to them. So you have Eric Kandel who points to the secessionists, the German Austrians and so on. You have Seymour Zeki who's pointing to you know, Calder. You have, you know, and it's not just Western art, you have V.S. Ramachandran who's pointing to classic Indian sculpture as the epitome of art. Um, 
And so that is why I very consciously sidestep questions about aesthetics, about beauty, about preference, because those questions are ones I don't think we're actually in a position to adjudicate or to touch. I'm much more interested in the kinds of nuts and bolts of how, what art teaches us about how vision works and how vision works in all people. So all of the issues that I raise today, I would argue are completely defensible using art from any tradition. So we could go and we could find, you know, ancient Egyptian uh, hieroglyphics that we could use to illustrate the same points. Um, the, the reason that I lean on a Western tradition is really just, I mean, it's two, two reasons. One is it's art I'm most familiar with and I know, and it's also art that most of the people I'm speaking to are familiar with. So if I show a picture from a different tradition, I now have to unpack that tradition. And I'm, I also feel some anxiety about doing that because it's like a kind of an appropriation. I feel like, well, I'm not, I don't, I don't have the authority to talk about that culture's artwork. So we're sort of in a little bit of a bind when it comes to that, that question. But I think a sensitivity about that issue is one that many scientists would do well to maybe um, sharpen because um, I, I think it's not uncommon that you know scientists that have, we are scientists, we're not gonna tell you the default mode network is telling you what's beautiful. And then I sort of scratch my head and say, so if I was in the scanner and my default node network didn't light up to when I looked at that thing, but I thought that thing was beautiful, are you telling me that I'm really not thinking that's beautiful? I mean, like I, this seems really screwed up. Um, and I, so that's all a very long, another long winded answer. Um, but, you know, I think that is a challenge. And um, I, I don't know what the right answer is sort of from a practical point of view. Um, in talking through these issues, because uh, I feel uncomfortable kind of appropriating images from other traditions. Um, but at the same time, I would like to hope that the phenomena that I'm describing generalize to all traditions. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm, um, thank you for all these wonderful uh, thoughts and questions. Um, I'm just being cognizant of the time. I think we have time for one more. Um, and I think Mary Sherman would like to ask something. Um, I just, uh, so, sorry, I need to unmic. Um, I just wanted to hear more about your artwork. If you could talk, I assume your research informs your artwork. Could you talk about that if I'm right or wrong? Or? Yeah, there's another hour lecture. Thank you so much <laughs> for the question. No, I'm really curious. Well, it's taken me a long time to be public about making art in this kind of a environment because I've made art my whole life. I don't really see making art and doing science as separate enterprises. They have for me completely the same objective, which is um, you know, to try and understand how the brain works and the, the, the way in which artists operate every artist I've met works this way. They are not sitting there trying to reconstitute something they picture in their mind's eye. They're running experiments. They're visual experiments. They're like, I will try this. I remember, I don't know if Nona is still making these amazing cloud pictures, but I remember when I saw them at first, you know, it was like hundreds of these clouds. And, and I was like, what's that? And she's like, well, I'm just playing. I'm sort of working through these. And I was like, these are experiments. They're experiments in how you create you know, an image that's reproducible in the sense that you do something and you know what the output will be. And when it isn't, that's fun because it's surprising. It teaches you something interesting about your experience. And I don't want to be, you know, telling Nona what she was doing, but that was my experience watching her work. And I think every artist is doing this. They're engaged in a kind of trial and error or a kind of experimentation, the goal of which is to open up new domains of knowledge, new, new ways of thinking about how the, how the brain, the eye and the brain and images work. Um, and that's all I'm doing in the laboratory. It's exactly the same. It's just, we get more money to do it and we have fancier tools and we have to write more protocols and we have you know a, a more codified kind of system. And maybe we might learn something about how the brain works that could help you know, cure diseases. And you know, we are working on various kinds of problems for uh, you know machine brain interfaces for curing blindness and that sort of thing. Um, the specific question you asked was about my artwork. I am not generally in the studio 
thinking, oh, there's this visual phenomenon, I would like to now illustrate it. So I'm, <laughs> I'm working in the studio like an artist working where I like put on my art hat and I'm like, this is fun. Like I'm at, mo most of the time you, I make good art when I'm having fun and bad art when I'm not having fun. Uh, I would say what the neuroscience does for me is it gives me a different lens once I've made work to think about what I did. So a lot of artists will interrogate their work. I mean, I had long chats with David Hockney where he said, you know, I got to leave this stuff all the way around me and look at it for like days and days and days and days. And then things sort of soak in and I kind of understand what's going on. And that it's active work. I mean, I'm sort of looking at what's going on and interrogating what worked and what didn't through a kind of extended viewing. And I think the neuroscience gives a different kind of language or a different lens, a different kind of structure to that kind of interrogation, which I do use. Um, so the whole bit about Matisse and the little white lines I showed, um, that was completely retroactive. The way I told that story is completely retroactive. What actually happened is I was making paintings in the studio with little like squiggles and lines, or whatever. And I remember, I think it was actually Carrie. I showed one of her, showed her one of my paintings like, this is now almost 10 years ago. Actually, it is 10 years ago. And she said, oh, there's so much air in your paintings. And I remember thinking, air in my paintings? What the hell does she mean there's air in my paintings? And so we sort of dissected it out. And I was like, oh, yeah, I mean, I'm leaving a lot of the paper blank. So I was like, well, that's it. I'm going to go back and get rid of all that white paper to see what's going on in the picture. And all of a sudden, I was like, oh, these images, they just, they, it felt constrained and not what I wanted. And I was like, what is that doing? Why is it doing that? And I was like, because the marks as I'm putting them next to each other are actually changing. I mean, they're changing in a way that I don't want. I need to pull them apart. And, you know, I fortunately at the time I had this fellowship at the Radcliffe Institute and I got to spend like days twiddling my thumbs. And I was like, I wonder what's going on. Like, why is this the case? And it dawned on me that it's really because I finally felt liberated to use colors like the 64 or 128, whatever colors that Holbein makes out of their, you know, they, they have all these beautiful pigments. I was like, I was just squeezing the color right out of the tubes, no mixing. And I was like, I want that color. I don't want anything else. I want that color. And so I was painting with this and then, and then you start putting them next to each other and they bleed into each other and they screw up. It's not the same thing. I was like, keep them apart. And it was through that process that I went back and I was like, oh, I wonder if industrialization and the development of new pigments really changed the way people painted. Because it would seem like the impulse I had to keep these colors separate must have been apparent from the moment these rich paintings first showed up, these pigments first showed up. So, um, so that's when I went down this road of looking at you know, other colorists and Matisse and then thinking about the issues that then arise in terms of neural encoding of color. Because I was like, well, if this is a trick that they're using to insulate colors, then that tells me something about how color contrast is actually computed in the brain. So then we started looking for those mechanisms and we found a whole bunch of stuff um, in, in terms of the neuroscience. So it's interactive, you know, it goes both ways. I said, the art is providing discoveries that inform science experiments and the flip side. I mean, one of the things I'm really interested in, I'll leave you with this, is yellow. I think yellow is absolutely fascinating. I don't like why yellow is brighter than white. No neuroscientist has any idea. We have no explanation for it. It's completely true. I've, you know, I've used it in paintings all the time. And I think it's actually a clue to something pretty fundamental about how color is constructed in the brain. Uh, but I don't know what it is yet. So stay tuned. <laughs> So um, as moderator, I'm just still watching the clock. I think we're at our, a little bit over our end. And um, thank you for all these wonderful questions, many of which I had thought of also, but you spoke maybe for me. Um, and Bevel, just thank you so much. Um, I would love to do another session with you and keep talking about all the things we didn't get to. Um, so, um, and again, thank you attendees for uh, being here and for your thoughts and questions. And um, as I said, this is our last of the season, of the spring season. Uh, we're taking a break for the summer, which means all the party work, thinking about the fall and spring um, programs. And um, we archive all our programs. We're actually, we don't have the uh, Zoom ones up yet, but we will see 
and you can also check out all our previous programs, including the one uh, that Caroline, uh, no, sorry, <laughs> Caroline did something with Seth Newgood, um, but the previous one that Bevel did, and um, we have podcasts, and um, we hope you have a good summer. So thank you very much. Everybody. Thank you so much for the invitation, and it was a pleasure. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Bethel. Yeah, take care. Okay. Have a good night.